Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad you're here uh, at Cedar Grove to worship with us this morning here and online. Uh, the ones to uh, be in prayer for today and this week, uh, Catherine and Travis, uh, Mike and Donna, Roger and Merle, Marty and Anita, Carl, Jay, Kathy, and uh, Tabitha. Uh, we're going to do a, a couple of songs, uh, special music, and then we'll get our pastor up here after that. Let's uh, please stand and turn to 448. Or it's on your screen, too. <laughs>
music today is Miss Tabitha. Thank you. Can't pay me no mind. Good to see y'all this morning, man. Getting back kind of normal here in here. That's good to see. Good to see some faces I haven't seen in a while. Uh, we're gonna have children's church down. Okay, the the kids that want to go to children's church can follow Miss Dawn there out. And uh, again, it is good to be here. And I tell you what, it's a lot easier preaching to people. And uh, we've had some people coming uh, all along, but it's, 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 I know they've thought, man, Marty's just angry at me. <laughs> but uh, it's, we can spread it around a little bit, Dave, so that's, that's good. And uh, good to see y'all, y'all. Um, I wanted to say there, there was a group of people that came out this week, and, and uh, there's people that's doing all kinds of stuff around here, but there's a group of people that came out and cleaned, and I just, uh, y'all know who you are, and I just appreciate y'all coming and cleaning the church. It was standing in need of that, and uh, I know God will bless y'all for that. This morning, um, Brother Laramie, during, during uh, Sunday school, he made mention of the fact that he, sometimes you just feel alone, you know, and he and I had spoken about that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, if you've been watching the uh, Wednesday night services, I, I actually spoke to that uh, one night about uh, Paul being in prison and Christ coming and standing beside of him. And uh, it's so easy to get to where we just feel like we're just all alone. And, and just the world we're living in today here in America, and it's not just in America, by the way, it's worldwide. I have friends all over the, the world. And everybody's suffering at some level with the things that's going on but it just seems like sometimes we're just back all the way up into the corner and we're just where is god in all of this thing you know what i'm saying i mean where where in the world is god in america today you know and, and we just we ask those questions well today we're going to look at something in the book of revelation so i want you to take your bibles you turn there to chapter 14 uh, and I want to say this, I, I, I kind of mentioned this last week, I think. 
Chapter 13 and chapter 14 is almost parenthetical, and I hope you understand what that means. It's like there, there's something going on, and then there's like a parenthesis, and it kind of gives you some information. It's not completely parenthetical, but it's, 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 it's giving you some information about some things that are happening during the tribulation period, okay? And uh, so today we're going to, we're going to, this passage is going to, it's actually going to start out at the midway point of the tribulation period and it's going to go all the way to the end of it. It's going to give us some information about both of those things. But that's not necessarily the way I want to preach it. So we're just going to look at it. Everybody with me in chapter 14 this morning? Amen. All right. I'm going to just read to you the, the first five verses. And then we'll go from there, okay? So if you would, chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping and their, with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne. And there were four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with women. They are virgins. Uh, these are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. These are the redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God to the Lamb. And their mouth in their mouth was found no guile, for uh, they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, as we look at this, uh, a lot of questions come up, I'm sure, and I'm not going to deal with all of those questions, I guarantee it. But... These 144,000, if you think back uh, several weeks, let me get my tail there called. Um, if you think back several weeks, we talked about these 144,000, and we pulled up to this place right here, and I gave you some information about the, this group of men. These guys are Jewish evangelists, okay? That's what they are. There are 144,000, 12,000 from every tribe of the tribes of Israel, not of the tribes of the United States, not the lost tribes over in England, but the tribes of Israel, okay? And the Bible is specifically clear about that. Don't let nobody try to fool you about who these people are. They are Jewish evangelists, all right? And they are on earth. And we talked about that, like I say, a few weeks ago, and I'm just wanting to joggle your memory a little bit. We talked about these guys. God supernaturally protects these 144,000 evangelists during the tribulation period. So they're not dead at this point, okay, because there's people that say they're dead. They're not dead. They are, uh, God is showing you a picture of them. Oh, me. They're on earth. The very last verse we read, verse 5, it says, and they are on earth. It tells you twice in this passage that they are on earth. Actually, three times if you look at the fact that the Lamb comes down to the Mount Zion. Okay? So they're on earth. And heaven opens up to them. And we know it's heaven because we've seen that picture over in, in chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6. The, the four beasts, and we said they were angels before the thrones of God. The four beasts, and then the twelve and twenty-four elders, that is the church that, that, has, uh, that has been redeemed, and it's in heaven uh, at the rapture of the church and the resurrection of the dead. They've all come up there now at this particular point, and they're worshiping. And heaven opens up, and the Lamb, I want you to look at this, verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a Lamb stood on Mount Zion with the hundred and forty-four thousand. And they had his father's name in their forehead. Okay? Folks, the Lamb of God's where this morning? He's in heaven. Where, where, where is he at in heaven? We know exactly the location. The right hand of the Father. Okay? Aren't you glad God's omnipresent? Amen. Yeah. 
You know, and so we see his omnipresence right here. The lamb is actually in the midst of this 144,000 as they are preaching the gospel. Okay? As they're suffering the sufferings that they are suffering in, the, in their time. Okay? Let me tell you something this morning. Let's just make a little application. You might feel alone, as Brother Laramie said this morning. You might feel alone like Marty feels once in a while, but I got news for you. Listen to me. When you got saved this morning, when you, if you're redeemed and you got saved, there's three that took residence up in your heart. And I can prove you that. The Bible tells you that. The Holy Spirit come and He sealed you. You're sealed with the, day of, uh, with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Guess what? You didn't do the sealing. God did the sealing. Laramie, He makes me some green beans once in a while. My wife does too. There's some other people, but that, that, that can seal. There ain't but one person going to open that can because my wife can't open it. <laughs> Marty. Well, let me tell you something. You seal by, by God's hand and it won't be opened until God opens it. You understand that? You, so, so you ain't lost this morning. If you ever got saved, you ain't lost. How's that? But the Bible also talks about God the Father taking up His abode in you. And God the Son taking up His abode in you. So it's the Trinity comes and moves inside of you when you're born again. Isn't that something? I like that. You know what? Because when the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit shows up, they have some worship service. So when, you, when I'm going to tell you right now, when, when you let the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit start controlling your life, you'll be able to come up into a worship service and you'll just be saying, Hallelujah! Hallelujah. I'm in church! Hallelujah! You know, and all of a sudden, we'll just have a whole new spirit in here. Now, I'm going to tell you what, I'm Baptist. I've been around them old cranky people my whole life. <laughs> and Baptists, they'll run about anything except chicken. I mean, we. But I'm telling you what, if we'll just let God have his way in our life, and we'll understand that we're not alone, that, that'll make you turn cartwheels when you come to church. These people here are going through the tribulation period. Folks, we've, we've looked at some of that now. We've looked at some of the things that's going on. And they're living through it. And they know that they have missed the rapture of the church. They knew that they missed their Messiah when He came the first time. And they have put their faith and trust in the Messiah. And they're preaching the Messiah now. And they're suffering greatly. And, they're, and the people around them are suffering. But right in the midst of it, God encourages them. I'm telling you what, I believe this is in Scripture right here for their encouragement in that day. Now you think Marty's crazy, but I'm telling you, they will have a copy of this right here. And in that day, I believe they'll come upon this and they'll say, I'm not alone. The Lamb's right here with me. God the Father is right here with me. All those that went before me is right here with me. The throne of God has been opened up to them. I'm telling you what, they some, you could just preach that right there. and We just won't, but I'm, I'm just telling you, there's they some stuff going on right here. We see their position with God in verse 2. I want you to look at it. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunder. And I heard a voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung... As it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song except for the 144,000 that were redeemed from the earth. They, they had a position and their position was before God. It was right in the presence of God. Aren't you glad this morning? Now, we're not in heaven. You understand that. We're on earth. But I've got news for you. The Bible says that we can boldly come before the throne of grace this morning. We can come before God's throne. One of the things, let me tell you, if you want to get a powerful, a powerful, I'm just going to help you out. We're going to run a rabbit. <laughs> I'm after him. All right, I'm telling you. If, you. if you want to have a powerful prayer life, when you get ready to pray, don't be in no hurry. Get, get ready to pray. Empty out your heart. Close your eyes. And imagine yourself walking into the presence of the throne room of God. And putting your knees down on the ground before Him. 
Because that's what we actually do when we pray. We enter into the presence, the very presence of God himself before his majesty and his throne. Man, isn't that good? You have access to the Father this morning. You don't have to come to the preacher. You don't have to go to some other fella, some other lady, and say, oh, will you pray for me? Will you beseech God on my behalf? We do that because we, want, we believe in the power of prayer and we believe in the agreements of other people with us. Amen? But let me tell you something. You don't have to go to somebody else. You go to your advocate right in the throne room. It says we can wholly make our request before Him. Man, they, they're right there in that day. It shows their character too. Verses 4 and 5. I know a lot of people don't like this, but this is just the way it is. These are they which are not defiled with women. They never, got, they never got married. Okay? For they're virgins. They're, they're, they're not defiled. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes. Man, I'm going to tell you what. We, my wife and I, we've been discussing some things and I've been talking with different people about it and I want to do a, when we get through with this, I want to do a series on discipleship and I want to do a, 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 a series on just what it means to be committed to God. But you see them right here. It says they follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes. That is the first characteristic of a disciple. We follow Jesus Christ. I'm taking a leadership class right now. Do you know what they tell you? The number one thing in the leadership class is as you follow God, as you, pastor, follow God, then the congregation should follow you. You deacon, you deacon, you Christian folks, you, as you follow God, your family follows you, your, your, your ministry follows you. And, and that's what it says, wheresoever the Lamb leads them, that's where they go. It shows their character, their, their undefiled they, they're following Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you what, when you got sin in your life, you listen to me now. Marty's, Marty's speaking from experience. My wife suffers with this, not me. Y'all believe that, don't you? When they sin in Marty's life, Marty has a hard time following God. These people were undefiled. They were following Christ with all they had. You want to have a better relationship? Period. Better relationship. Follow Christ closer. Get the sin out of your life. Get the sin out of your life. Let's go on. In their mouth was found no guile. They didn't go around creating problems. And they, were, and they were without fault before the throne of God. Let me stop this morning and just tell you something. Even in my dirty state that I get in once in a while, when I'm before the throne of God, I'm without fault. You know why? Because the blood has been applied to my life. I said it a couple of weeks ago. And I don't really want to rehash this, but you need to hear it, okay? One thing I found about preaching and teaching, you've got to repeat it, repeat it, repeat it to get people to catch it, okay? When, when, my, when my son was trying to play baseball, I had to throw the ball and throw the ball and throw the ball before he got to where he could catch it, and he'd still miss it once in a while. It was the same ball. It was the same glove. You know what I'm saying? So we had to throw it, throw it, throw it. But let me tell you something this morning. We have an advocate. If you are born again this morning, if you can truly say that you, are, you belong to Jesus Christ, you have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, I've got news for you this morning. When you step up to the, to the bar, you have an advocate between you and God, and that is Jesus Christ. And as Satan stands over there, the accuser of the brethren, that accuses them day and night, he says, and Marty did this, and he says, He's guiltless. He's under the blood. Ain't that good this morning? Because I'm going to tell you what, Marty's been falling on his face a bunch with all this corona stuff. I know y'all haven't, but I have. But he says, Marty is guilty of this. Look what he's done. 
And he says, it's under the blood. God the Father sitting on his throne says, I don't see any guilt. All I see is the blood applied. Ain't that good this morning? If that don't make you feel good, you're dead. We need to call we need to call the CPR people up here, okay? All right. Let's move. Verses six and seven. It says, And I saw another angel. Now, this is actually going to be the first angel we see in this particular passage. There's actually six angels in this passage of scripture. Three of them bring what could be stated as good news, and three of them bring judgment. Okay? This is the first one that we're actually going to see in this chapter. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having everlasting life, the gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and every kindred and every tongue and every people, saying with a loud voice, <clears throat> hang on, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him who made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of the water. I want you to know God is still working through His people, but at this moment in time, He sends an angel through heaven preaching the gospel. Isn't that something? That tells me a lot of things. Okay, it tells me a lot of things, but let me just tell you something. We as a people must be failing because we have been given the good news that, listen to me, while you are dying in your sins and trespasses, Jesus Christ died for you, and you can be forgiven and not die in your sins and trespasses, but, but if, when you do die, you'll go to heaven. If you'll just trust in Him as your Savior. But somehow or another, we're afraid to tell people that. And more and more, we're getting where we don't tell people that. Because you've got to give them the bad news before you give them the good news. And we see so much bad news, we just don't want to be accused of nothing. So we just sit over there. And we don't share the gospel with people. And so during the tribulation period, God has to send an angel giving the good news. And I want you to see who all gets saved. It's not just Jewish people. I hear people all the time say, well, does the Jews get saved during the tribulation? No. What does it say right there? Of every tongue and every kindred. There will be Hindus and Indians and Muslims and Middle Easterners and Asians and Americans and, and Europeans and, and Jewish people. It will be all kindreds. Coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. There's going to be some kind of major revival during the tribulation. I'm glad I'm not going to be here. Amen. Whoo! I'm glad I'm not going to be here for that. But, uh, but I, 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 I tell you, it's going to be good. And it's, it's to everyone. Verse 8. I've got to find my place. Verse 8. And there followed another angel. Here's, here's the second angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of wrath of her fornication. All right, now this is symbolic. It's a system. We'll learn about that. Like I say, this is, a, this is just kind of like almost a parenthesis, and it's giving you something that we're going to learn about here in a week or two. But Babylon is, is, is this system, and it's fallen. And it's crumbling. I'm going to tell you now you, that you, Marty's just going to get crazy here. So y'all just say, go ahead, say Marty's crazy. Marty's crazy. All right, Marty's crazy. I think when you look at all of the craziness that is going on, and I don't care where you fall that in it, I, I, that's not my point here, all the craziness of, of all the stuff going on, and regardless of what side you're on, you're blinded to anything else that's happening. Does, do you see what I, I hope I'm making sense? I don't know if I am or not. But there's a system that Satan is running. And we can see it even right now in this, this election here with all the stuff that's going on. It is like, it's, 
Nobody's in control. It don't, don't make any sense from anybody's side, whether you're a Republican or Democrat. I don't care who you are. It just don't make any sense. And you've got to say that there's something else behind this. Something else behind it. And again, I ain't, I ain't, I'm not endorsing nobody. I'm just saying our world is a mess. A mess. And this system that Satan is building up is going to completely crumble. And we're going to see when we get there, the nations are going to mourn over this thing. They're going to mourn over it. All right, so let's move on. Verses 9 through 12. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receiveth his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture unto a cup of indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, Whosoever worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name, and here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that uh, keep the commandments of God and faith in Jesus. I want you to know this is a punishment to come. A punishment to come. Okay. Again, we're looking at a period of time, and he's giving you all kinds of information. I want to give you something about hell this morning, though. Okay? Now, you listen to me. Now, I'm not one of these people get up here and try to preach you in heaven through hell. Okay? But right here, we're dealing with it in the text. All right? Now, to start with, when we talk, and I heard, I think Laramie might have done this a couple weeks ago. I'm not sure. Somebody did it recently. But hell is a holding place. If today I got locked up for killing somebody, and I wouldn't do that, but if I got locked up for killing somebody, they, would, they wouldn't take me down to central prison and put me in prison. What would it take? Yeah, they'd take me to the jailhouse. When people die in this dispensation that we live in, they go to the holding tank. They go to the jail, county jail. There'll be a time of a white throne judgment where all the dead from hell and from every other place come up before the throne of God and they're judged. Okay? This is the judgment that we see right here. Now I want you to listen to me. Because what happens, let, let me just stop. What happens with hell? It's cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is going to be where the final abode of the wicked dead is. Okay? So now, look what it says. Verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now what's happening here on earth during this tribulation period? It's the wine of the wrath of God being poured out. Which is poured out without mix mixture into a cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So those people who are cast in the lake of fire, they're going to be tormented with fire and brimstone. Jesus said the same thing over and over and over again. Okay? Fire and brimstone. Weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth is something else that he added into that. Now I want you to look for how long it is. Look at verse 11. We have people, we have some people that rewrite the Bible and they say, God just annihilates those people that we have some that say, well, when you die and you're wicked, you just stay dead. What does it say right here? Look at verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever, and how long? And ever. And they have what? When? Day or night. Stay with me just a minute. Don't let me lose you. Don't lose the internet. Stay with me. It is forever and ever. No annihilation. No easing up. 
And it is day and night. Somehow or another, in eternal punishment, people are going to see the day came up. There's 12 hours in the day. The day goes down. There's 12 hours in the night. The day comes up. And there's 12 hours in the day. And the night, they're able to keep time. They're able to keep time. So I've been in this torment for a thousand years. And I just got started. It's forever and ever. And I'm not trying to say that to scare you. I'm trying to say that because that's what the Bible says. Now, I'm going to say something else because people say, well, if God's really good, He wouldn't do this. If God wasn't really good, He would have not provided a way for you to get saved. Well, he only, you've got to believe in Jesus. I know people that believe in something else. Well, let me tell you something. He made a way. Jesus said, I am the way, not one of the ways. Okay? If you want to go to the Father, you've got to go through the Son. No other way. He came. He gave His life. Praise be to God, He made a way. He, he, we didn't deserve a way. Marty didn't deserve a way. I'm nowhere near as wicked as some people that I know. But I'm going to tell you what. I was just as enough wicked not to go to heaven. You understand what I'm saying? I wasn't Adolf Hitler. I wasn't Stalin. But I was lost in my sins and my trespasses. And I deserve the wrath of God poured upon my life and upon me for eternity. But God in His wonderful mercy, He reached down and He called my name and He took me by the hand and He saved me. And if you can't say that this morning, you are in jeopardy of what we just read about. Praise be to God. I'm glad He gave me a chance. He may be tugging on your heart this morning. He may, be, he may be speaking to you this very morning saying, come to me. I got things, I got joys that you don't even know about. Won't you come to me? But it's up to you this morning. It's not up to the Baptists. It's not up to the Catholics. It's not up to the Methodists. It's not up to anybody else. It's up to you this morning. Won't you be saved today? Let's go on and look at this thing real quick. I got to hurry. My time's is fleeting, but we're we, we going to get on down through this thing. Verse 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the, the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth saith the Spirit, and the, and the rest of their labors and works do follow them. I want you to know something this morning. Whatever you labor in as a Christian, you might think you're alone. You might think you're wasting your time, but God is keeping a record of it. Don't worry about whether the preacher knows about it or the deacons know about it or your neighbor knows about it. God knows about it this morning. And He's keeping a record of it. And that record won't never be lost. Amen. I'm telling you what. Let's go. Let's go. Verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and uh, and upon that cloud one set like unto the Son of Man, having his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice, and him that sat upon the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. The harvest of the earth, earth is ripe. And he said on the cloud, thrust in his, his sickle into the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had the power over fire, and cried with a loud voice unto him that had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine and the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle, unto the earth, and it was gathered unto the vine of the earth, and cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God, and the winepress was trodden without the city, 
and blood came out of the wine press, even to the horse's bridle, to the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. This is the Battle of Armageddon right here. And it's where you, you hear the songs and you, you hear people talk about the blood to the horse's bridle. This is it right here in the Battle of Armageddon. I want to show you one picture. Who is it that's doing the treading of the wine press? I want you to go with me to Revelation chapter 19 real quick. And we're done. Look with me in verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and righteousness does he judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This is Jesus Christ right here. And that's exactly what we just read about in that last verse. The battle of Armageddon. He comes and he treads the wine press alone. He alone. Are you ready for that? Are you ready? You're going to be with him if you're, if you're a saved saint this morning. It says the armies of heavens in the next verse is with him. Guess who's coming? I don't even like horses. I'm going to ask them, can they give me a Harley? <laughs> At least a Honda. You know, I, I don't like horses. <laughs> How are you this morning, church? Do you feel alone? Take courage. You're not alone this morning. Take courage. You feel like nobody don't know what you do? Take courage. God's writing it down. Are you here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior? Are you on the internet? You don't know Christ as your Savior? Take courage. Jesus died for you too. All it takes, all it takes, just stepping out. Just stepping out and saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. I believe that your son came. I believe he went to a cross and bled on my behalf. And I believe he was raised for my justification. I believe your son is God. And he died for me. Will you save me? That's all it takes. That's all it takes. A lot of people are missing. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this day. And I thank you for this opportunity to come preach to this group of people this morning. Thank you for everybody who's came out. Such an encouragement, not only to me, but to others that are here. But Father, I ask that you just bless them. Father, I, I ask that you take this, this message, and I don't want to call it the little message, it came from you. And I just pray this morning that you'll take and just burn it into our hearts. Lord, encourage us that we're not alone. Father, encourage us to keep on keep it on. Father, there may be people here, there may be people on the internet, there may be somebody 10 years from now curious. When I pray that you'll take the power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and I pray that it'll penetrate hearts, and I pray that it'll save somebody. Your glory.